Hello, uh, I would like to begin this session with a land acknowledgement. The land that I'm standing on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. And it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. With deep gratitude to my ancestors, the ancestors of this land, women, girls, and the diverse people that call this land home, I welcome you to Hungry for Comfort, Chinese Food, Diversity and Delights. My name is Pailagi Pandya, Program Officer at Scarborough Museum. Scarborough Museum is pleased to host this exciting series at Toronto History Museums. Hungry for Comfort is an exploration of culinary food stories. This year, the spotlight is on Toronto's Chinese communities. These stories will educate, inspire, and connect you to their culinary history on a safe online platform. Food for me is a symbol of our human relations, nostalgia, and a lens. Among many things, like it being a reminder of need, hunger, sustainability, it reminds me of comfort. The comfort of my grandmother's care, eating dal and rice, recreating home away from home in the spices that my mother stuffed our suitcases with when we immigrated to Canada. Home in the smell and the taste of food around the world and comfort of community in individual and collective shared cooking experiences in the kitchens of Scarborough Museum. With that, I'd like to introduce Professor Chef Leo Chan, who is co-curator of this series, along with historian Arlene Chan. Born in Macau and raised in Hong Kong, Leo came to Canada in 1966. He was educated at York University, Ryerson and Cornell, and taught at George Brown and Humber Colleges. He also held senior positions in hotel and restaurant chains in Canada. My wife and I are deeply honored to be the cultural curator of this year's Hungry for Comfort series celebrating our food and history, Chinese food, diversity and delight. We want to thank the Toronto History Museum, Scarborough Museum at the Thompson Memorial Park is a community hub that brings to life the diverse history of Scarborough and its residents. Please visit them when you have a chance. You will feel the warmth of the surroundings, taste the freshly baked goods, merge yourself in their indigenous garden and mural, and join them at their culinary events. A culinary journey through Toronto Chinatown by the eight precious pearls. We are a group of friends with different background and discipline and we are a research group of Chinese food history in Toronto. This red gate on Spadina is a Chinese character, Do Mun, or Poto. It is through this time portal that we're going to travel back in time and take a virtual stroll along Spadina, and we will explore some of the food memories. Following Arlene Chan's talk about some of the earlier Chinese restaurants, in the 1960s and throughout the 1970s, the biggest change in Chinatown is the successive waves of immigration coming from Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, and mainland China accompanied by a totally different eating experience. Regional cuisine of China became popular in mainstream Canada. The best way to describe the diverse cuisine tradition of China is simply North 
south, east, and west. We have some food images of the food being served here in Toronto locally. They may not be exactly the same as the way it's being served back home. It's the interpretation of a different presentation, color, and styles. So let's go to the north. Peking duck is no doubt a good introduction to the northern Chinese cuisine from the city of Beijing. There is no such a thing as the best cuisine from China, but the province of Shandong can claim to be the oldest school. It is also the birthplace of Confucius. Instead of serving the big egg roll, restaurants are serving smaller and thinner spring roll, but still with plum sauce. Along the northern sea coast of China, abalone, sea cucumber, and local fish and shellfish are prized ingredients. And from Mongolia, the new cuisine and hot pot is introduced to Chinese restaurant in Toronto. In the south, dim sum and drinking Chinese tea is very fashionable. When you're in a Chinese restaurant serving dim sum, server will come by with wagons. You don't have to speak Chinese. You just have to point and somehow they understand what you want. By the way, the word dim sum in Chinese means pointing to your heart. And when the Cantonese people say going for dim sum, they say yam cha, which literally means to drink tea. Noodles, buns, snacks are available in a lot of restaurants. Now, Cantonese charming can be made with soft noodles, and sometimes people will prefer it crispier. In fact, there are some who serve it in shape of a bird's nest basket. People in the South love seafood, but for the lobster, they are serving it in Hong Kong style. And along Spadina and Dundas, there's a lot of barbecue store that will have a display of cooked meat for customers who want to have a takeout or a dining experience. Going to the east, we have this delicious pork belly with the thick, dark, sweet sauce. This dish is served with baby shrimp and the local tea, dragon well tea, Longjiang. It was originally created for a visiting emperor. And it was in the city of the West Lake within Hongjiao. Dragon is associated with the emperor. In fact, some Chinese call themselves descendants of the dragon. This giant sized meatball called lion head was served with a darker sauce in China. But here is smaller and lighter color with Shanghai bok choy. Although the dish is originally not from Shanghai, it is from a neighbor city called Yangjiao, famous for the fried rice. Now back there, the fried rice, unlike the traditional Chinese takeout rice, is cooked with very little soy sauce. The best, I was told, is not oily, but not burnt. It's not easy to do that with a hot wok. I guess it's important to use day old rice, just like you do not toast freshly made bread, you use day old bread. Finally, we go to the West. Kung Po chicken is a specialty from the province of Guaijiao. Is made with diced chicken, spicy red pepper, and nuts. So be very careful with this one. Now the use of pepper is not intended to 
paralyze your taste sensation. It was supposed to stimulate your palate. But this soup is very hot and spicy. And in the Western provinces, other foods such as binke tofu, like mapo tofu, or eggplant can be very spicy as well. The long bean, the significance of that, it represents long life. So it is important, don't cut this into small pieces. Chinese food, there's a lot of symbolism. Unknown to many, the province of Hunan used very rich and heavy seasoning. The province produced more and consumed more chili pa uh, pepper than its neighboring province of Sichuan. Previously, Arin Chan talked about some of the earlier restaurants that opened in 1940s and 50s. It is a period known as the first golden era of Chinese dining. Restaurants such as Nanking, Lichi Garden, Sai Wu and Kuang Chao, plus many other restaurants in Chinatown changed the whole profile of the restaurant experience. Meanwhile, outside Chinatown, there are some Chinese and Polynesian restaurant and bar open in the Porsche and predominantly Jewish area in Forest Hill and North York. Restaurants such as House of Chan and Si Hai famous Chinese food become local landmark. Movies and documentaries were made there and one at Si Hai is called a Jewish Christmas. An interesting concept become popular serving both Cantonese and Mandarin cuisine in China House on Eglinton near Bathurst. They started a new trend, serving dim sum and Peking duck. What is Mandarin cooking? It is an old Portuguese word and also a Latin word meaning one who command. A Mandarin is a high position, a position of inference in Imperial China. Mandarin is a restaurant marketing expression, not a regional cooking style, but it means of aristocratic and really high quality, the best of its kind. It's a good word. Meanwhile, more restaurants open in Toronto, East Chinatown, Scarborough, North York, Markham, Richmond Hill, Vaughan, and Mississauga. But back in old Chinatown, in the village by the Grange, there's a restaurant called Young Lock. They have a dim sum market, Mongolian grill, lobster tank, and they also have a good selection of international wine, including wines from China. And in the same village by the Grange Mall, a restaurant called Ginsberg and Wong had a very innovative concept of serving Jewish and Chinese food in what they call a food emporium. Now, this is something really new for the people who are visiting or working at the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario, or student from OCAP and U of T. The artist Shelly Zhang have this piece of artwork entitled A Place for Wholesome Amusement. It connected the Jewish and the Chinese culture. It was displayed at the Fenster Gallery. On the second floor of a five-star hotel on Chestnut Street is a jam called Lai Wa Hin. In Chinese, the name means a luxurious meeting place. It has accolade from the New York Times, we call it the best place for dim sum, perhaps in North America. Toronto Chinatown 
is now at a crossroads. Everything is changing. People are changing. Business are changing. The choice of Chinese food are changing. This was a old building on Spadina. There's been many owners, operator, pioneer, many different Chinese food concepts. It was finally sold. New development is everywhere. New business, new faces, new language, new different Chinese dialect. Toronto Chinatown is no longer a homogeneous neighborhood. But outside Chinatown, fine Chinese dining flourish in a spectacular fashion. Casa Imperial is in a heritage building on Steels and Warden in Scarborough. And if you go to Vaughan, New Market in Mississauga, you will find a restaurant called Cynthia Dining. It will remind you of the splendor of Imperial China. Both the owner of that previous restaurant, Casa Imperial, Elaine Lee, and the owner of Cynthia, Cynthia Lam, they are both previous recipients of the prestigious Asian Restaurateur Award from the ORHMA, Ontario Restaurant, Hotel and Motel Association, and also the Cambridge Remy Martin Award for high quality food, service, and their leadership in the hospitality industry. This former restaurant in Richmond Hill with a very new interior design, a departure from the old style in Chinatown. And now buns, dumpling, and noodles are served in opulent setting. This chain has one in Richmond Hill and one in Toronto Chinatown and Spadina in the Dragon Condo, ground floor. If you go to Main Cuisine in Richmond Hill, you will find display of wine, which suggests that Chinese food will be a good match for very high-end wine. And you can choose your fish or lobster from that uh, showcase tank in the back. It is not just the food or the atmosphere. It is really the people that make the biggest difference. The original founders of the Mandarin start the first restaurant in 1979. They purchased an existing restaurant called the Mandarin, but they've expanded with their famous buffet concept and the franchise system to 29 locations across Ontario. There are many individuals and celebrity chefs who have made their mark in Toronto. Chef Martin Yan started his award-winning TV show, Yan Can Cook, in 1983, right here in Canada. Although Chef Martin Yan is currently in San Francisco, he come back to Toronto regularly to help out. He support local activities as a food judge and also as a goodwill ambassador. He help out the Toronto East Chinatown and participate in big events such as Dragon Ball. The master of Asian fusion cuisine, Chef Suza Lee. He loved to do his fresh vegetable and grocery shopping in Chinatown. I have seen Chef Suza Lee on Spadina and Dundas many, many times. A former owner and chef of some of the Canada's most famous restaurants such as Splendido and Nota Bene, Chef David Lee is currently running some very successful food concept in Toronto. And he said he used to love going to a restaurant at night 
on Spadina, Chinese restaurant, after work. And Chef David Lee's grandfather is from Beijing, the late pastry chef, Donald Duan. He's born in Vietnam and studied at George Brown, and later he taught there. He had served the Pope, royalties, and many international movie stars from TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, with his creative and amazing dessert. Chef have never forgotten his Vietnamese and Chinese roots. Chef Nick Liu run the top, one of the top restaurants in Canada, Bailo on College Street. His Hakka wonton with exo sauce is legendary. R&D is a modern Asian restaurant in Toronto Chinatown in Spadina. Chef Eric Chong is the first winner of Master Chef Canada, and as you can see, he's holding the trophy of the Asian Restaurateur of the Year. He is the generation of the new chefs in Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back through that time portal and Spadina. I think it's only fitting we finish our culinary journey with this smiling lady from Mother's Dumpling. We dedicate this presentation to the thousands of women and men who have worked in Toronto Chinatown. Thank you. Professor Daniel Bender, the director of the Culinary Research Centre and the Canada Research Chair of Food and Culture at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He is the author and editor of five books and is currently completing a global history of culinary tourism entitled The Food Adventures How Around the World Travel Changed the Way We Eat. Professor Bender is also the editor of Gastronomica, the Journal of Food Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Professor Daniel Bender. Thanks, Leo. And thanks for inviting me to be part of this project. You know, Leo, the pandemic has got us thinking. For our audience, try this. Draw a mental map of the globe in your head. Where, from what parts of the world have you ordered food, figuratively speaking? Which places, which restaurants now do you really miss? Draw a map now of the city where you live. Is it just the food that you miss or is it the restaurants themselves? Is it the experience of dining out? Is it a favorite waiter? Perhaps the cook? If you're like me, you already have a list in your head of where you'd like to go first after you get that vaccination. The pandemic has got us thinking, what really is a restaurant? Is it just a place to get food? Is it an alternative to home cooking? Just an alternative to home cooking? Or is it something more? Is it a place to try new foods? To learn about other cultures? Is it a form of virtual tourism? A way to travel around the world without ever really leaving your own postal code? Is it a source of entertainment? Is it a place to drink with food? Now let's think about it from the other side of the table. Restaurant is a source of employment and not just for the cooks and servers who work there, but for all of those folks who supply the restaurants. Restaurants are also expressions of culture. And that gets us thinking as well, what then? is a Chinese restaurant. The history of Chinese restaurants in this city 
is entwined with the change and growth of Toronto itself. Restaurants are a sensory way that customers, cooks, servers, suppliers, and more interacted with and often resisted changing immigration policies. Those who worked in restaurants, those who started restaurants, those who owned restaurants, and those who supplied them, all confronted and resisted the racism that accompanied the long history of immigration policy in this country. Our history is going to lead us today almost to the present day. Let's start then right in the middle of our chronology with the opening of the Nanking Tavern in 1947. The restaurant promised something new. It took out advertisements in local newspapers and indeed newspapers as far away as Ottawa. It promised a new, more exciting, more exotic dining experience. It had a liquor license. It offered an expansive menu, even if what was on offer often reached back to the chop suey palaces that Canadians were familiar with. Some of what was on the menu, it was a bit like the chow mein dish we're going to see in later in the program. The Nanking Tavern promised an exciting, enticing, exotic interior. Over the course of the next few decades, it would advertise new special dining rooms, the Bamboo Room, the Confucius Room, here are some of the advertisements from the 1940s for the Nanking Tavern and its various rooms. There's a number of key words that we might look at here. Taste thrill, chop suey, delectable. And this word, comfort. It's a fascinating word, isn't it? Comfort. It's promising something safe and exotic all at the same time. In many ways, I think that that subtle negotiation, comfort and exoticism, was at the heart of the success of restaurants like the Nanking Tavern. And let's also fit, look even further inside the restaurant to look at some of the menus that we see. Here's a menu from 1949. This menu is part of the menu collection Chinese restaurant menu collection housed at the University of Toronto Scarborough Library. Our audience can find copies of these menus digitized online. Here we see the cocktail menu. And that was part of the success of restaurants like the Nanking Tavern. They promised the opportunity to drink exciting and different cocktails and plenty of alcohol to go with exciting food. You know, I'm fascinated by these menus that get marked up. It gives us a sense. They're almost like ghosts, those little scribbles along the side, the changed prices. It gives us a sense that these, these were menus were alive, that they were being passed from hand to hand, back and forth between servers and customers. It's the, the living memory of the food that was served, the bottles that were open, the food that was consumed, and the thousands of customers and dozens of cooks who worked there. Menus are also negotiations. They're negotiations between what the cooks want to serve, how they want to represent their own culture, their own society, and their own cuisines. But they're also catering to the different concerns, desires of customers. Take, for example, these special Chinese full course diners. My colleague, student and friend, Kobe Song Nichols, has argued that these set menus were specially designed for customers did not identify as Chinese as a way of literally serving up Chinese cuisine in safe and exciting ways. 
It's also notable on these menus, the range of dishes that were there, and as well, the dishes that were not there. Certainly there were dishes like the chop suey that reached back to the longer history of Chinese restaurants and cafes in Toronto, but dishes like the barbecued dishes, the fancy dishes as well, that promised something new. I'm also struck by what isn't there. Those Western dishes that often could be found on smaller Chinese cafes. The Nanking restaurant reached back to the past, all the way to the beginning of the 20th century when Toronto's first Chinese restaurants were opened. The history of Chinese restaurants in Toronto is set against the larger history of Chinese immigration to Canada. 16,000 Chinese laborers came to Canada, were drawn to Canada, enticed to Canada between 1880 and 1885 to work, for example, building the Canadian Pacific Railway. Once the railway was done, the heavy hand of anti-Chinese sentiment transformed immigration policy. By 1885, Canada, along with many other nations around the Pacific, introduced a racist head tax. The head tax would only be raised for the next few decades. And yet, despite that, Chinese restaurants thrived. By 1922, there were a hundred different cafes and restaurants, Chinese cafes and restaurants, in what had come, what many had come to call Chinatown, a recognizable area shaped by its many restaurants, its food shops, and its suppliers. It was also a center of population. By 1921, the community had grown to more than 2,000 people settling around Dundas Street and along Elizabeth Street, just to locate us in space for those of you who know Toronto. What did restaurants like these offer? They offered cheap eats. They offered something exciting. For those who worked in them, they offered employment in the face of a racist climate that often denied Chinese migrants and their children jobs. The long supply chains brought vegetables, imported ingredients from nearby farms and from faraway China. Chinese restaurateurs were building an important local economy, but they still faced persistent racism that was often expressed in gendered terms. A newspaper editorial in 1907, for example, warned readers that the Chinese were contributing to, quote, national decay. Moral reformers following the lead of editorials like this one circulated warnings about the, quote, lure of the Chinaman. Around that same time, the city of Toronto tried to pass laws that would refuse licenses to Chinese restaurateurs who employed white women. These laws would actually end up on the book all the way into the 1920s, though in many ways they weren't enforced. Ironically, and perhaps because of that promise of decay, white customers did frequent these restaurants, drawn by the exotic cuisine and affordable prices. The very same newspaper that was warning of national decay was also encouraging, in its food pages, encouraging customers to visit the restaurants. But again, that encouragement also came in racial terms. In 1917, one newspaper critic wrote, quote, even when I go to a Chinese restaurant, the mystery of chop suey no longer holds me. I seek the darker mysteries of yet goi main or egg fu young. 
Again, what we see there is that paradox, the paradox of racism and enticement. The racism added to the allure and it's also made the Chinese restaurants so important to the fabric of the migrant community. I want to show you in this next slide some work that my colleague Jeffrey Pilcher and his research team has done. These extraordinary maps, which can be found at the Culinaria Research Center website, illustrate the changing patterns of Toronto's culinary infrastructure. I encourage our audience to go and experiment with these slides to see not just how Chinese restaurants, but Chinese shops, other kinds of shops, other kinds of restaurants, have transformed the way Toronto feeds itself. Each of these dots represents a Chinese restaurant from 1925. We can see the way in which they are centered in what was at the time Chinatown, with a few outliers in the city's west and east end. If we jump forward to 1950 in our next slide, we can see the impact of both racist cultures and racial immigration policy. The number of Chinese restaurants had steeply declined by mid-century. Yet Toronto's taste for East Asian cuisine, for the tastes of Chinese food, persisted. By the 1960s, some of the Toronto's most successful, highest grossing restaurants weren't French, weren't English. They were this new cuisine. They were Polynesian. Polynesian food was a made up cuisine. It had its roots in tourism, in military rest and recreation, and at beach leisure, not in anything remotely South Pacific. In fact, and we're going to look inside this menu in a moment, Polynesian food was largely Chinese tastes, removed from their regional roots, drenched in soy sauce and sugar, and served with copious sweet rum-laced cocktails. Here then is some of the menus, the inside of the menus of some of Toronto's Polynesian restaurants. The ports of call, poo poo platter, ribs, bali hay, Hawaiian ribs, egg rolls, crab rolls. All these taking the flavors that were already familiar to Chinese diners and blending them with the allure of a beach vacation. If you look at the prices and compare the prices here to what you saw at Nanking Tavern from just the previous decade, you can see that these were also expensive restaurants. This was, in a way, Toronto's fine dining. Against the backdrop of the popularity of these kinds of restaurants, came the deliberate attack on Toronto's Chinatown. Many scholars have talked about this simply in terms of urban planning. I'm going to suggest that it wasn't just urban planning that led to the life, death, and ultimately rebirth of Toronto's Chinatown. It was that ongoing paradox of racism and enticement. This was a newspaper article from the Toronto Daily Star in the fall of 1960. Here the reporter leads us on a walk through the old Chinatown. Just the name, gone are the smelly glories, speaks to that sense of racism, the antipathy, and yet, he doesn't ignore the Chinese restaurants. Rather, there's a certain longing 
for places like the Kong Chao and Li Chi Gardens that he both denigrates in this column and draws customers to them all at the same time. By 1953, in this climate of racist disapproval that we can see in this column, two thirds of Chinatown was expropriated, displacing residents and businesses. I'm arguing here that the notion of smells, of decay, of exoticism that McPherson talks about in this column rendered it possible to expropriate Chinatown. It was also what drew people to Chinatown. It rendered these restaurants both a draw in Toronto, but foreign to Toronto. Chinese restaurants thrived remarkably in the face of this kind of antipathy. The transformation of Toronto's downtown Chinatown came as Toronto's immigration policy was beginning to change. We jumped then from downtown to Scarborough itself. 19th century Scarborough's villages like Agincourt and Malvern were relatively rural villages, slow to change, though thriving from the railroads that passed through them. They were often outposts of Scottish and English migrant cultures. Scarborough was a landscape of small villages dotting the farmland until the post-World War II construction boom and then the immigration wave that would transform Toronto into the sprawling diasporic city that we know today. Suburbia conquered the fields and single family homes sprang up throughout the 1950s, 1960s and beyond. In the mid-1980s, change came again to Scarborough. As Chinese entrepreneurs, developers, and restaurateurs moved their businesses from the downtown Chinatown or opened new ones altogether. Again, let's pull back then to talk about the longer history of immigration. The Immigration Act of 1976 introduced a new form, a new way of allowing immigrants into Canada. The impact of this policy was dramatic. In 1966, 87% of newcomers to Toronto and to Canada came from Europe. By, the by 1970, 50% were arriving from non-European regions. By 2001, the top four source countries for immigration to both Toronto and to Canada were China, India, Pakistan, and the Philippines. Political turmoil in Hong Kong in the 1980s and 1990s brought a new wave of both developers and migrants. Many settled in Chinatown and brought with them dreams of food and of businesses. From the 1980s onward, clusters that came to be called Chinatowns were located in Scarborough's inner suburbs. These were often located around automobiles and malls. I want to draw you to this particular newspaper article about the transformation of the Agincourt uh, uh, neighborhood in Scarborough. The headline, an evolution from village to Asian court. It smells funny to me. I'd encourage us to have a conversation about that. The very wording of that village sounds, sounds natural. It sounds um, of the earth, agent court 
sounds dismissive. It gives a sense of taking over. And I think in the wording of that, of this very newspaper article, we can see the ways in which the spread of Chinatowns became part of a larger conflict about what it really meant to be a multi-ethnic Chinatown and a multi-ethnic society. And I'm drawing here on the work of some of my culinaria colleagues, Professor Joey Tasharma and Dr. Camille Bejan. One of the things that they did in their project was to return to historic photographs that are held in the Multicultural History Society of Ontario and to then go out into the community itself and take those photographs again. So here is a slide from one of the many developments that brought businesses and consumers to Scarborough's new Chinatowns. This here is 25 Watford Drive, seen in 1991 and again in 2014. By the mid 1980s, there were about 40,000 Chinese Canadians living in Scarborough, about 25,000 of these in the Agincourt area. Their arrival, the arrival of their restaurants, and of developments like these, the Dragon Center, here seen in 1991 and again in 2013. These developments faced local resistance, and this local resistance was tinged with racism. In May 1984, my colleagues have demonstrated an overwhelmingly white Central Agincourt Ratepayers Association held a meeting in opposition to the development of the Dragon Center. Throughout the room, you could hear the racialized comments. Let them learn English. The mayor's office responded by setting up a task force, a task force on race relations, it was called, to consider the social conflict that was surrounding the developments in Scarborough. Listen to some of their conclusions. Quote, the new Chinese enterprises in the area are booming. This contrast is creating a rift along racial lines between two factors, factions of the business community. Chinese success is being set against a long-term recession in the area. It's a fascinating wording, isn't it? It's a wording that seems to place the blame for the conflict on the new businesses, overwhelmingly food businesses that were moving in. Let's pull back again in our next slide. Here then are the Chinese restaurants in 1980. You see that the, that the economy of Chinese restaurants has rebounded and slowly making their way into Scarborough. And in our next slide, we see this remarkable image now pulling back to see the entire GTA. An almost sea of pink, we see the success of Chinese restaurants throughout the city of Toronto, throughout Scarborough, and into its suburbs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Can you tell us why Scarborough is called the capital of cuisine? Well, it's a fitting name. Scarborough is, ever since I moved to Toronto 20, almost 20 years ago, Scarborough has, has drawn me and it's drawn everyone who I've taken out for dinner. Just the sheer array of food is extraordinary. But you know, Leo, I, I think it's more than that. And, and I, I, in the context of the pandemic, I, I feel that it's more than just the array of food. I, I think it's also 
about the people who are there and the restaurants that are there and and the sense of of excitement that you can feel as you drive down the streets unfortunately as you drive it is still an automobile culture but there's a sense of not just the sheer delights that await you it's also the people serving and the sense that when you're dining you're part of something vibrant to me that's as good a definition of a of a culinary capital as i could find thank you my other question is at the Scarborough Fair Conference at 2016, which you host, the theme was a global food waste and local foods. And can you tell us a little bit more about that theme and that it is in a transnational city? That was the name of the theme. Well. You know, and I, I think that part of the story that we've seen with Chinese restaurants for the last more than century here in, in Toronto really is a city of those, is, is a story of those transnational ties. It's about the movement of people, the mobility of people, the incredible courage of people resisting um, the racism that, that, that stood in the way of their mobility. And I think we've seen the ways in which food has been, the ways in which mobile people maintain ties, maintain ties, maintain ties to each other locally and maintain ties far away. So in some sense, when you eat in a Chinese restaurant in Toronto, it's local food. It's local people who are cooking it. It's often local, fairly locally grown ingredients but they're also tied to something global. So it's global and it's transnational. What really is more Canadian than Scarborough's Chinese restaurants? We need to find a, 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 a Canadian national dish. It's probably in a Chinese restaurant in Scarborough. Thank you very much, Dan. Ladies and gentlemen, my former colleague and guest chef at the Humber College Asian Cuisine program, Chef Wilson Chan. He will be doing a cooking demonstration of a very popular dish called Cantonese Chow Mein. Let's welcome Chef Wilson Chan. Hi everyone, my name is Wilson Chan. I'm the corporate chef at Mandarin Restaurant. Today, I'm really excited to show you the wonderful dish, Cantonese Chow Mein. It's very popular at Mandarin restaurant. Also, it's really easy to cook at home. Now, I'm going to show you some ingredients. We have noodles, chicken breast, barbecue pork, and shrimp. Also, we have some uh, vegetable. We have broccoli, mushroom, red pepper, green pepper, baby corn, and water chestnut, celery, and onion. Also, we have some uh, seasoning. We have salt, chicken base, sesame oil, sugar, oil, minced garlic, white pepper, cornstarch, and water, and some chicken broth. So right now, I'm going to marry the chicken and shrimp. This is the chicken. Okay, a little bit of salt. And white pepper. cornstarch and a little bit of water so mix well mix to it and make it even okay last we put some a uh, little bit oil to mix well Okay, and put it aside. And the shrimp, same thing. We just put a little bit of salt, white pepper, cornstarch, and two teaspoons of water to mix well.
you can use a hand. Sometimes you are tongue is okay, but you can use a hand. You can touch the foot, the feeling. You can feel all oh, the foot is like that. Okay, and that's it. Last one, we put a little bit of oil to mix well. Okay, and set aside. This is um, egg noodles. It's a very popular at Chinese um, supermarket. Okay, it's a dry noodle. You have defrost the noodle and going to boil water to cook about one minute. This is very easy. Later, I will show you how to cook the noodle. And then the barbecue pork is uh, using the Chinese uh, summer uh, sauce, special sauce to make the barbecue pork about cook uh, 45 minutes. Now, I'm going to cook the Cantonese chow mein. Okay, now we just uh, put all the vegetables put in the boiled water, okay? Broccoli mushroom, celery, green onion, red pepper, green pepper, water chestnut, and baby corn. So the put the inside boil about is a uh, 15 seconds, okay? All right, and that's it. Drink well, put on the side, okay? So right now, I'm going to uh, heat a pan, and then put a little bit of oil inside. Okay, now, we put the chicken in the pan. About half a minute, we can turn to the other side, okay? And see the chicken have a little flying color, and then we add a shrimp inside too. Put the shrimps are very easy because just the color change the red color, and the shrimps almost done. Okay. You can see the color change a little bit. When turn to the other side, all the swim is a change of red color now. You can see the other side too. Oh, almost done. We add a barbecue pot inside too. Now add a little bit of oil and put some garlic. You stir well and put back the vegetable. You can smell the fragrance, right? Okay, and then you put the chicken broth inside. And add some seasoning. Salt, sugar, chicken base. and mix well. Now, at the same time, we have put the noodle inside too. The noodle, put into boiled water.
put the inside about one minute. Okay. And keep going to cook the noodle. Now we have the water. Put some cornstarch inside to mix well. And then to make the sauce thicken. Almost done. The noodle is almost done too. You can see the noodle. It's almost, almost cooked. Okay. And join well, set on the side. Last one, we'll put a little bit of sesame oil to mix well. Now, you can see the noodle is strained already and put on the plate. Now, we paste all the shrimp, barbecue pork, chicken on the top. And the canton de charmen, almost like that. Finish. This is a canton de charmen. Looks beautiful and fresh. It is very easy to make at home. Also, it has ingredients, very simple. We have some noodle, vegetable, barbecue pork, shrimp, and chicken. And then the barbecue pork, in Chinese, we also call cha siu. Cha siu means the barbecue pork. You can buy it from any Chinese supermarket. You see the noodle, right? We just put the boiled water to boil the noodle. Some people like the noodle more more crispy. You can use the pan fry the noodle. Both sides pan fry to brown color and then put on the plate and the other one paste the food on the top. So make the noodle more more crunchy. You don't need to any commercial wok or pan to cook this dish. Just using the regular pan at home and easy to cook. Thank you for watching and learning about this dish. You can find all the ingredients in the description below. Enjoy your food. Hey Wilson, that's great. Thank you very much. Now You're we welcome. work together. And um, what are some of your great um, Mandarin moments and great um, Mandarin experience that you can recall? Um, there are many great moments. I have had at Mandarin Hamilton over the years. I will always remember the time spent with my brothers and staff. It was, it, um, it was always a family environment and we always were together to make Mandarin Hamilton is a great place to dine. Some of my favorite Mandarin experience um, we were able to celebrate Christmas with staff and their family. We are very really fun to play together and eat together. So this experience is very good for me. For my favorite Mandarin experience was uh, competing for the Mandarin Best of the Best Award. This is a good experience for me. Indeed, and I remember Hamilton's always do very well with the Best of the Best. Yes, always on the top five. I enjoy working with uh, you and your partners. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember the taste testing events. And I also remember serving with you, Dr. Lincoln Alexander, when he came to the Mandarin uh, Hamilton and gave out awards to master students. Yeah, yes. Uh, Dr. Yes. Alexander is a regular customer. And um, do you remember what he liked to eat? Um, I remember Dr. Lincoln Alexander. He really enjoyed our egg rolls and fried rice. He was a really nice person. He's a very really good guy. Yeah, I miss, I miss, I miss him. We all miss uh, Dr. Alexander. Mm -hmm. I also remember you and I worked together to serve two university presidents. The master university president was entertaining his counterpart from Beijing University at his home. 
Mm -hmm. You may not remember what we serve, neither do I, but I remember we have both Chinese and Canadian food. It was what I remember as East meet West. Right, right. Yes, I remember myself um, serving both university presidents. I forgot the dish we serve, but I remember them enjoying our food and having a great time. Yeah. You were also a guest chef with me at Humber College Asian Cuisine Program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the student learned a lot from you. Um, what are some of the things that you remember teaching them in the food demo? Um, I remember that. So the Cantonese Charmin was the dish I demonstrated the most. Sweet and sour pork was also another dish I cooked it at Hamburg College. Yeah, both of them, the students really like it and uh, enjoy them. Well, especially they got to eat it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Now that you are the corporate chef of the Mandarin, what are some of your happiest or your favorite duty um, there as your new position? Um, it was working as a copy chef in Mandarin head office. I really enjoy creating new dish and planning new menu and keep our food have a good quality and safety. This is my job, right? Thank you to our speakers, Leo Chan and Daniel Bender and to Wilson Chan for the cooking demonstrations. The Scarborough Museum is located near the intersection of Brimley Road and Lawrence Avenue East. Listening to Leo and Dan and watching Wilson, there are so many restaurants that I would love to visit now. All of the sessions in this Hungry for Comfort series is posted on YouTube. Thank you for joining us.